Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another APSAD Insight webinar. My name is Jim Hunt. I'm one of the NAS educators here. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and owners of the land that we're meeting and presenting on today, the Yuggera and Turrbal people. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and I'd like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that might be joining us out there in webinar land today. So thank you and welcome to the presentation. Unfortunately, we've had to have a bit of a jig around today because for those of you that aren't in Brisbane, we've gone down to another lockdown. So you may see Jeremy or myself donning and doffing masks at various points. We apologise for that. But please bear with us and thank you so much for joining us. Today, I think we're in for a bit of an interesting one. It's going to be a bit of a history lesson as well as some current stuff, I think, is what Jeremy's got planned. Um, Dr. Jeremy Haler, who's our presenter today, is the clinical director here where I work in Biala, and he's talking about substance use through the ages. So without much further ado, I shall hand over to Jeremy, but during the presentation, please type your questions in the chat section of this uh, presentation, and then I'll present them. Jeremy's got about 15 minutes afterwards to stay around and answer some questions, so please feel free to talk type those in so that I can ask them to them. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jeremy Haler. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thanks very much, Jim, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. So um, this is a slightly ambiguous title. Uh, we're, we're really going to talk about um, preconception through to old age, and we'll intersperse with a few images of substances um, since ancient uh, Greece. Um, a few disclosures, nothing too relevant, I hope. Just to point out, though, um, I'm a board member of an NGO and I've been on the board for about eight years when I first started Metro North HHS Alcohol and Drug Service and Lives Live Well had about the same budget. Now Lives Live Well has a turnover of 55 million and we've really remained, remained fairly static. Uh, I think we've gone from 17 to 19 million. So it's quite interesting to contrast the two uh, sectors. Um, so the, the image on the right is from a Penguin Classic showing a, a symposium. Um, that is an after dr dinner drinking fest for those who weren't aware. So when we go to a symposium these days, we need to be mindful of its uh, real meaning from the Greek. So as I mentioned, we're going to look through the ages. and These are some of the topics. I've slightly oversold uh, in my promo, I'm afraid, because I had to remove some of the areas because of the pressure of time and I've still got too many slides so I may be going a little swiftly and apologies for that. Um, so I'm going to start with the global burden of disease across the lifespan attributable to uh, substance disorders. Uh, and there's just an image of, of mead which um, is of course derived from honey, fermented honey producing an alcoholic beverage and here are the bees working hard in a an image from the um, 1600s. Uh, so risk factors for disability adjusted life years um, from the GBD Global Burden of Disease study published just uh, last year in The Lancet. And this is age naught to 10. And clearly uh, substances don't get a look in here. Um, low birth weight and early for dates are the two major contributors there. And we go down the list. However, as soon as we reach the uh, teen years, um, alcohol use comes in second, drug use comes in sixth. Um, if we then go ahead to um, the 25 to 49 age group, uh, alcohol comes top with 6.3% of the dailies are attributable to alcohol uh, excess. Smoking is not so far behind. Add those two together. If you add drug use on top, then really substances can claim a rather dubious title of being the major contributor to disability adjusted life years, uh, particularly in this age group. We go from 50 to 75. And as you'd expect, because of smoking being a low burn, that's kind of creeping up the table to be the second most important factor, attributing 15.5% uh, of uh, disability adjusted life year years. And alcohol use has slipped back a bit. And then if we get to the over 75s, it's really only smoking that remains. And if they're all added together in, in the mix, so across the entire lifespan, um, then we can see smoking comes second now, 
and alcohol use uh, 3.7%. So it's interesting to have that perspective and a changing perspective over the uh, life cycle. Uh, laudanum used to be sold for uh, children with um, sore teeth, teething problems and things. Laudanum is opium in a 40% solution of alcohol. And it was very popular in the 19th century. This bottle comes from the USA. It was also sold in, in the UK and I believe in Australia. Um, so this is looking at harms in a slightly different way. Uh, there was a, an earlier study from David Nutt and colleagues in the UK. And then uh, Australia did its own uh, harm drug harms ranking study with a multi-criteria decision analysis, which is basically a very grand term for a group of um, clinicians and experts getting together and deciding what really counts in terms of harms to the individual user and harms to others. And you won't be surprised to see alcohol comes out top, followed fairly closely by uh, methamphetamine and heroin uh, behind that. And then we kind of taper down through a, a range of other substances. Um, methadone's in here, uh, mainly harm to others, um, sorry, harm to the users rather than harm to others, uh, and likewise buprenorphine. Um, but compared with heroin and, and meth, they're, they're really much less important. So having kind of taken that global view, let's look at pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, smoking is the most important preventable cause of harm during pregnancy, and not just pregnancy, of course, as we saw from those earlier data. There's a strong association with disadvantage, youth, um, First Nations, status. Um, and of course, in those groups, smoking is much more prevalent, unfortunately. Um, less than half of pregnant smokers quit during pregnancy, though many do quit. Many use pregnancy as a, a driver to quit. Um, if you manage to quit in the first trimester, you have a similar outcome to non-smokers. Of course, one of the uh, effects of smoking is reduced appetite and often weight reduction. And that's one of the reasons I think uh, women may continue to smoke is uh, they want to end up with a smaller baby and an easier delivery. However, the adverse effects of smoking are both seen during the pregnancy and longer term in the offspring. Uh, there is a, a clear dose relationship. So the less you smoke, the better. Cutting down may help. And nicotine replacement therapy, this is still rather controversial because we know nicotine is potentially toxic to the developing brain. So clearly smoking is, is not helpful for the developing uh, fetus. What about nicotine replacement? And therefore the question arises, what is the best way to support quitting? So Cochrane has had a lot to say in these areas and a review of the pharmacological interventions for smoking cessation in pregnancy published in 2020 shows little evidence to support, although they didn't find harms. So that may be a bit surprising. That's the data from studies in pregnancy. Behavioral support and as, as an adjunct does increase the rate of quitting uh, when put on to pharmacotherapy, which as we've seen here, doesn't really seem to have an effect on its own. And we would always recommend anyone going, say with nicotine, replacement therapy, had counselling to support and inform the uh, chemotherapy, the, the nicotine therapy. Now, what really comes out very strongly as um, effective is contingency management, so incentives for cessation. And in Scotland a few years ago, there was an incentive through pharmacies to pay pregnant women money to come in with uh, negative carbon monoxide uh, exhaled air. And this can increase rates of quitting by between 50 and 250%. So really quite dramatic. It is a somewhat sensitive intervention. Um, we're kind of concerned about the courier mail test, uh, smoking mothers given money to stop smoking, those sorts of things. However, handled uh, appropriately, I think this is really the key to progress with helping uh, mothers to be, to quit during pregnancy. So I mentioned the toxic effects, and this is just a list of those from that paper by um, Mendelssohn that I mentioned earlier. So there are effects on fertility, um, on the obstetric course, preterm labor is more common, placenta previa more common, abruption more common, uh, greater incidence of stillbirth, ectopics, preeclampsia is reduced paradoxically. So that's one benefit from smoking, but it's clearly very much outweighed by all the negative effects. Um, I mentioned intrauterine growth retardation. There's a number of studies there's about a 200 gram mean reduction in birth weight in mothers who've been smoking. Uh, a threefold incidence, another way to look at it. 
and a range of birth defects are also seen in, in mothers who smoked uh, in, in the child, in the offspring, including club foot and eye defects. Now, smoking is the leading cause. Now we've worked out supine positioning of sudden infant death syndrome with a fourfold increase in incidence. There's a greater likelihood of obesity in the child, of type two diabetes, of developing nicotine dependence. And here's a bit of a surprise, a four times increase in the rate of childhood leukemia. There's also effects on respiratory function in the child, on cognition and mental health with a significant increase for most disorders in early adulthood. So really dramatic effects across both mother, babe and uh, growing child, negative effects from tobacco use. What about alcohol? Well, we're becoming increasingly familiar with um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, aren't we? And uh, I took some of this information from Professor Elizabeth Elliott, who's an obstetrician, um, no, she's a, a pediatrician um, in Sydney, who presented at uh, the uh, recent conference that was held virtually, um, International Medicine in Addiction. So alcohol is both neurotoxic and teratogenic. Remarkably, almost half of pregnancies in Australia are unplanned. And it's often several weeks during the early pregnancy before people realize that they're pregnant. And we'll show on the next slide how organs are developing, critical organs during that time. About a third of women drink during pregnancy. That's much higher than the international figures. So we define uh, FAST-D based on three criteria in the current Australian guidelines from 2016. Exposure, documented exposure to alcohol. And note, they don't say how much. There's no sense that if you're under two standard drinks a day, you're all right. That doesn't really seem to operate in this area. Um, neurodevelopmental impairment and distinct facial features. And uh, Prof Elliot also talked about sophisticated three-dimensional facial, facial imaging, which has recently been used to show subtle changes from exposure to alcohol in pregnancy, even low exposure during the first trimester. So we no longer necessarily have to rely on the fairly gross changes that are seen in, in, the, in the child. We can also show more subtle changes. And if they're in the appearance of the face, imagine what may be happening to the brain beneath. Now this, I was really shocked to see, the mean age of death of someone with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is 34. Compare that with the average life expectancy in Australia, which is around 80. And those deaths are due to suicide infections and cardiovascular disease. Here are some uh, typical images of FASD. Uh, there's a hockey uh, stick palmer crease. So this is quite a tight angle here. If everyone's looking at their palm now, they, they won't see the same angle, I hope, uh, tailing off between the index and middle fingers. Um, in the child, there's a, a thinner upper lip and loss of the philtrum with a more extensive um, distance there between nose and lip and a low set ears as highlighted here. So in Canada, uh, there's been a study estimating the cost to the community is over $10 billion per year. And indeed, each affected child costs $2 million. Uh, often that's uh, a lot of interaction with justice and uh, imprisonment. Um, so with uh, FASD, which has an incidence of about 1%, we've got increased rates of ADHD, anxiety, autism, spectrum disorder, attachment disorder, sleep disorder, and impaired executive function. So typically these children do not foresee the consequences of their actions. And while that's a feature of children as their frontal lobes are developing or their prefrontal lobes in particular, it's very much more pronounced in FASD. A third of those in youth custody have FASD. I've mentioned the 49% of women who drink alcohol before they're aware of their pregnancy. And a, a, an astonishing almost one third still are unaware of the risks of alcohol during pregnancy and another one fifth are tolerant to the possible adverse effects of drinking in pregnancy. So there's now a national strategic action plan which takes us through to 2028, which is really trying to tackle this. And of course, you're aware that it's more concentrated in First Nations communities. And that's where Elizabeth Elliott's done a lot of her work in WA. Um, this is a, a cartoon from Hogarth in 1750, Gin Lane, many of you will be familiar with it. And here, unfortunately, is a child about to fall to its doom. Uh, mother is clearly heavily intoxicated. I think there's a bottle here somewhere. Uh, those are syphilitic sores on his leg. This is the barber here who's committed suicide because no one's uh, attending to their appearance. 
and really there's uh, rolling and drinking in the streets and it's all terrible. The one prosperous person is the pawnbroker because everyone's pawning their possessions to buy alcohol. And a more recent interpretation published in the BMJ uh, shows the booze supermarket uh, operating and um, all the other kind of catastrophes which result um, from alcohol. Hogarth also uh, did a picture of Beer Street, I think, or Beer, anyway, one showing the, the prosperous uh, look of people simply drinking beer, not spirits. Uh, so it, there's some license he was using there, perhaps, because really it's the amount of alcohol, although spirits are more concentrated, of course, so it's easier to uh, generate harmful effects. Now let's turn from alcohol to pregnancy, managing opioid use disorder in pregnancy. What about opioid treatment? Well, we've now got three styles of treatment, the, the daily dosing with methadone or buprenorphine and the long acting injectable buprenorphine treatments, which although in theory uh, are contraindicated in pregnancy uh, because they're all category C, they're seen as drugs which owing to their pharmacological effects have caused or may be suspected of causing harmful effects on the human fetus or neonate without causing malformations. Uh, so the consequence of this is we really try and weigh the risks with the benefits. Neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome is one of the concerns for mothers uh, whose children have been exposed in utero. Um, what does Cochrane have to say about maintenance treatment uh, in opioid dependent pregnancy, pregnant mothers? Well, the numbers are fairly small and there aren't that many trials. And there's quite a lot of loss of patients during the studies. In particular, the trial, the mother trial by Hendry Jones and others published in the New England uh, I remember when it came out, it's 11 years old now, time passes, suggested that there were favourable outcomes for mothers on buprenorphine. But as some of the critics pointed out, almost a third of the mothers on bup were lost to follow up in that study. Uh, so really, I think the message here is that good antenatal care, attending to all the different needs of the mother in pregnancy, is what really counts. And it's less important whether they're on buprenorphine or methadone. And indeed, the dose of methadone does not really predict reliably the incidence of neonatal abstinence. So we really need to focus on good antenatal care from an early start and making sure the mother is stable. And smoking is a, an important uh, target for, for quitting, maybe with contingency management, as we discussed earlier. So moving from um, the treatment of opioid dependence in pregnancy, just an interesting take on the safety of codeine during breastfeeding. And one is counseled to be cautious about breastfeeding uh, while on methadone or buprenorphine. Small amounts do get into the mother's milk and therefore may uh, expose the infant. Though often this may be part of their kind of withdrawal program uh, postpartum. However, this is a, a rather alarming case a few years ago now because perhaps awareness has increased. Mother took uh, three, sorry, two lots of paracetamol and codeine 30 milligrams um, twice daily for pain after delivery. She dropped that on day three because she was feeling drowsy. She was breastfeeding her infant, which was slow to feed and becoming more and more lethargic uh, by day seven. Saw a pediatrician, didn't find anything too bad. However, on day 13, the baby was cyanosed and dead. And they measured uh, substances in, in the mother, mother's milk and in the baby and showed very high levels of morphine. So neonatal analgesia requires about 10 nanograms per mil. The, the blood levels in the baby uh, were 70, so seven times that. And they were wondering what the possible cause could be and then figured out that the mother had increased CYP2D6 activity. And you may be aware that 2D6 is the enzyme which converts codeine into morphine. And really morphine is the active agent uh, when you administer codeine. And so this lady had an extra gene to convert uh, the codeine to morphine. She was an ultra rapid metabolizer as they're called. And that in turn led to her own feeling drowsy because of the effects of codeine, i.e. morphine. And unfortunately, very sadly to the death of her infant. So there's an alarm bell ringing. Uh, this is more substance use through the ages. As recently as 1896, you can see here a guy in a respectable suit with his um, neighbor and uh, an opium pipe. This is a, an opium den in Melbourne. Uh, 
Uh, so we're now moving through the age spectrum to young children um, with various substances that can cause major harms to children through poisonings. So cannabis containing edibles, there's been quite a lot of publicity there about children getting hold of uh, biscuits and so forth with uh, cannabis within. We're all very uh, mindful of methadone uh, bottles being diverted, and that's why we try to ensure they're in uh, locked containers, uh, and we try to manage unsupervised doses, particularly uh, with COVID in, in conflict. Um, I remember when the buprenorphine naloxone film first came out, um, Jim was doing a presentation at APSAD and he handed everyone uh, one of the placebo um, samples and a lot of people had quite a lot of trouble opening the childproof packaging so I, I'm reassured that the packaging of the film is quite resistant. However, nicotine and vaping liquids is another story and here we have a, a coroner's report, the finding into death with an inquest, Baby J. Um, and what we have here is an 18 month old child who had a cardiac arrest soon after ingestion of nicotine liquid that was being used to fill a vaping device. The um, belief is that between one and 13 milligrams per kilogram represents an, a lethal dose of nicotine. And that means a five mils volume of a 1.8% solution um, may be enough to kill uh, an adult. Uh, if, if given early enough, atropine may be helpful. In this case, mother was doing, uh, filling the vape of herself and her partner. And she was distracted for a moment. And during that time, the baby grabbed the bottle with the nicotine concentrate in it and took a swig. Mother immediately realized and called uh, ambulance and so forth. But unfortunately, the child died about 36 hours later. So there's discussion of tamper-proof packaging of nicotine products. Yet we know at the moment most of them are imported from New Zealand or China or the States and in effect they're, they're illegal, they're not regulated. Uh, we know that on the 1st of October it's being moved to Schedule 4 supply. I don't know whether supply will be available, whether it will change the kind of current uh, system which is in operation. So this is a huge study and sorry a huge table. It's just to highlight the effect of adverse childhood experience on health. So this is a really big study of um, over 11,000, sorry, 20, 253,000 uh, children taken from 37 studies, looking at the outcomes of children with adverse childhood experience. And what I've highlighted here is a 5.6 times increased rate of illicit drug use, uh, similar rates of increased problematic alcohol use and their problematic drug use, tenfold increase. Uh, we shouldn't neglect here suicide attempts, 30-fold increase. Um, violence, victimization, seven-fold increase. So really dramatic consequences from adverse childhood experience. And one might wonder why this should be. Um, there's a couple of pointers here. So this is a study of telomeres. Telomeres are the caps on chromosomes and we think of telomeres as protecting chromosomes from damage during life. And the shorter the telomere, the less uh, telomere there is, the shorter the cap, the less protection is offered to the DNA. So what this study shows is that when young children are exposed to uh, violence uh, at the age of five, their telomeres are dramatically shortened. And there's a good correlation between the length of the telomere and the uh, childhood exposure during uh, that critical formative year between the ages of naught and five. So uh, the more exposure, the more uh, loss of telomere length. Therefore, the more vulnerable the DNA is to premature aging. So that was a study from 2012 in molecular psychiatry. There's also been a more recent study from 2020, clinical epigenetics. This is adverse childhood experiences again, DNA methylation, age acceleration. So they're using methylation as a sort of surrogate for uh, aging, premature aging. And this was just a thousand children in the UK who were prospectively followed for 17 years. So they looked for adverse childhood experience from age 0 to 14 and methylation rates at 17. And interestingly, they found a clear difference between boys and girls. So the, the girls had a proportionate increase in methylation according to the uh, number of adverse childhood experiences, whereas for boys, it made very little difference. So um, 
that one of the hypotheses was uh, this is a sort of stress response with high levels of cortisol. So they also measured cortisol rates and that really didn't correlate at all. However, the DNA methylation is something that promotes age related changes and it helps kind of explain the health and social effects of adverse childhood experience. Uh, now, anyone who wants to read this Drug Watch article will gain an insight into how Juul became spectacularly successful. Juul, you may be aware, is this rather stylish USB stick looking cigarette, which is uh, electronic cigarette, which delivers nicotine products. And compared with a cigarette, it can actually deliver a lot more nicotine. For, for a cigarette to deliver nicotine, you have to have combustion. And for combustion, you have to breathe in the product. Uh, for Juul, you can carry on sucking away and get much higher rates. And the company also uh, made sure that the uh, nicotine it was delivering was weaponized by combining it with, I think, benzoic acid to produce the perfect uh, combination of chemicals to uh, produce the most rapid hit. So um, I commend this article to you. It really shows the commercialization of uh, the electronic cigarette. So are they useful for smoking cessation? This is the question I want to place to you. Uh, Hayden Robbie here, one of the authors was in Brisbane a couple of years ago. He talked to one of the mental health seminars and, and he's well published in this area. He works in New Zealand and the UK. One positive step by President Trump or former President Trump was to ban flavored cigarettes, flavored e-cigarettes uh, in January, 2020 which was a, a positive step forward because we know there are thousands of flavors out there in Italy. And of course, they're mainly targeting children uh, because they're going to be more attracted to uh, strawberry cheesecake flavor than adults, perhaps, although adults seem to like strawberry cheesecake flavor as well. Uh, and don't really ask the question, well, what is that likely to be doing to your lungs? So what this Cochrane review showed was there was a 1.6% increased rate of quitting compared with nicotine replacement or varenicline from electronic cigarettes. This translates into four extra quit successes per 100 quit attempts. So it's not exactly dramatic, but it's certainly going in the right direction. What they also showed was that if you uh, just vape without nicotine liquid, you don't really increase your quitting rates compared with kind of the controls. Um, now, one of the worries that I have about uh, e-cigarettes, and Jewel illustrates this point perfectly, is the association between e-cigarette use and future combustible cigarette use. And this is from the States uh, over the, the, the recent time, 217 to 219. And this is when Juul was really taking off. So some of the earlier studies were pre-Juul. This one captures Juul very well. So what we can see from the data is that between 2018 and 19, ever used an e-cigarette, that's more than doubled in these young adults, so aged I think 10 to 24. Uh, current smokers has gone up threefold from 0.9 to 2.8%. Ever smokers has gone up fivefold or sixfold. So this was a survey of over 3,000 youth um, and it looked at the e-cigarette in the household. And if they calculate you use an e-cigarette in 2018, you had an eightfold increased risk of cigarette use in 2019. Compare that with uh, smoking parents, for example, which just produce a two to threefold increase in risk. So this is a dramatic problem uh, that e-cigarette exposure in uh, adolescence is very uh, commonly associated with progressing to uh, combustible tobacco use. And that, of course, explains why the tobacco manufacturers are increasingly buying up e-cigarette producers and um, nicotine liquid or e-cigarette producers. So it's a really cynical exercise in uh, exploiting the addiction, the dependence forming properties of nicotine. So if we were having a debate, what would you advise your patients? Should we promote vaping e-cigarettes or electronic nicotine delivery systems uh, to them or not? Well, if we have the for the motion, it does seem to work for older smokers who've tried everything without success. Public Health England, which has now been abolished uh, during the COVID epidemic, go figure, says that it's 95% safer than smoking tobacco. Uh, there are some downsides though um, from tobacco as well as health ones. There's a, a third of all litter is cigarette related. About 4.5 trillion butts each year land up in the sea and they're poisonous because of the heavy metals and other chemicals trapped in the in effectively the plastic nature of the filter, which does not break down in nature. Uh, 
Um, it's 80% cheaper than tobacco because you don't pay taxes on your e-cigarette liquid, though that may change, of course. And there are probably many fewer house fires compared with cigarettes, though I, I in my preliminary research, I didn't find actual data to support that, but there was a, a Hansard entry claiming fewer house fires in South Australia. Against the motion, well, we worry about renormalizing tobacco use, exposing youth to nicotine. This is a big issue, I feel. Um, many flavors I've mentioned, it's throwing a lifeline potentially to big tobacco, which was on the way out on its knees in the 1990s. Um, there are nasty burns recorded from exploding batteries particularly made, some of those made in uh, the democratic, um, yes. Uh, the Ivali crisis we will have heard of, the e-cigarette vaping uh, associated lung injury uh, crisis. And that was due to a contaminant of THC oil, vitamin E acetate. So there have been almost no deaths associated with uh, vaping uh, nicotine liquids. Um, this was a slide from the 30s, uh, trying to frighten people about the use of marijuana. And, you know, if a child were to see that, I think that would be the first thing they would reach for. Uh, weird orgies, wild parties, who wouldn't? So I've now kind of gone to the prison population. Here's an example of an injection device. I think this tubing comes from the um, sanitizer bottle. So it's been recycled to form uh, an injection device. So very crude, impossible to clean properly, and a, a very excellent way to transmit HIV if there's any around, and hep C. So in the prison populations, we now have direct acting agents, which have really gone a long way, though I'm afraid some of our patients say, yes, I did get treated in jail, and I carried on using uh, these sorts of injection devices. So really, this is a call for uh, needle syringe programs of some description in, in the jail setting. Uh, there's a strong resistance to this, although there's an excellent return on investment. In some settings, uh, bleach is supplied to clean this equipment, uh, but the clean equipment is not provided in the first place, which doesn't seem to me terribly logical. I'm sure you'd agree. Opioid use disorder and treatment is gradually unrolling in Queensland, that is. Some other states have progressed much further. And I think the long-acting injectable buprenorphine products are really extremely well suited uh, because they get around the daily dosing, the daily drug round, the daily monitoring for um, dosing, the daily standover, which people may experience to uh, give up their dose to someone else. And of course, we really shouldn't overlook the alternatives to prison, diversion, and then down the track, decriminalisation, legalisation, but we don't have time to go there today. So drug-related deaths soon after release from prison, this is a huge public health problem. Um, so six studies, a meta-analysis, uh, almost 70,000 person years, 1,000 deaths, 612 due to uh, overdose. And in the first two weeks of release, a three to eight fold increase in risk across the studies. And they do vary in different countries. So Australia did somewhat better than uh, the, the UK or the US. Um, perhaps because we've got better access to opioid treatment. But imagine if people uh, had a, a long-acting injectable buprenorphine dose at or shortly before their release. That would give them excellent protection for several weeks and give them time to get into treatment. Now, it's not going to solve everything, but it would be a, a major step forward, I think. Even in weeks three to four, we have an increased risk, but it's very much those early one to two weeks when people celebrate their release from jail they often relapse to cigarette smoking. So 75% of those who release from that non-smoking environment will start smoking on the day of release. Um, so a big study from Louisa Degenhart and her colleagues in New South Wales, 35,000 patients on opioid treatment followed for 22 years, during which time almost half of them were incarcerated at a cost of almost $3 billion. We know just by way of comparison in Queensland that the indirect and direct costs of incarceration for each individual are about $160,000 per year. So what this study showed, and it was published in 2014, but I still think it's, it's valid to discuss it, um, that opioid treatment in jail uh, reduced the rate of uh, recidivism, return to jail by about 15%. Uh, opioid treatment in, in prison reduced the risk of death as it did post-release by about three quarters. And of 100,000 patient years after release, there were about 1,000 deaths. So 
1%. So huge numbers and really convincing data showing the benefits of opioid treatment. Now let's move ahead to older adults as we go through the age spectrum. And I remember this uh, gentleman very well, retired dentist, and he'd come top in his year of dental school. Um, I don't know whether dentists drink more, dental students drink more than medic students, but there's probably a competition between them. Anyway, his alcohol use started uh, in dental school. school. He was referred by the aged care service at Prince Charles Hospital, who felt he had alcohol-related dementia. He presented to the hospital a few months earlier with a fractured neck of femur after a fall when he was intoxicated. His complicated recovery post-op, uh, complicated by alcohol withdrawal, meant he was in hospital for many weeks. And when he finally got to see me, it was clear he was still drinking six to eight units per day, starting at uh, four in the afternoon when he sat down to read the paper. I asked him about what was in the paper, uh, the, the current news, and he really, I'm afraid, had no, no idea at all. Um, his MOCA score was just 12 out of 30. So very significant cognitive impairment. Remember, President Trump scored 30 out of 30. So, you know, there's the difference. He was living at home with his wife and she had been his dental receptionist. So uh, even though she was kind of making all the decisions, he would get very difficult if, if he wasn't provided with his daily alcohol. And one of the maneuvers that we discussed was um, trying now Trexone to reduce his uh, desire to drink uh, that was off PBS because he expressed no intention of quitting. We also tried alcohol-free beer, beer and neither of them seemed to have a perceptible uh, benefit. So of course we have these questions about his autonomy. He wanted a drink he didn't see or didn't mind about the harm it was causing. He could always tell me the, the Commonwealth bulk share price though, which is interesting. So there were, there were little uh, lacunae of knowledge, but overall his capacity was severely impaired. Is this someone who should be submitted to involuntary treatment? That was one uh, bit of advice I got when I spoke to an old age psychiatrist about how to manage the situation. So I, I saw him regularly for a couple of years and we'd sort of go through the reasoning and the reasons for cutting back and trying to moderate his intake and trying these steps. Uh, and then I'm afraid he had further falls, uh, which meant he could no longer stay at home with his wife. So he was admitted to uh, nursing care facility. So he stopped coming to see me. So this is really sad. This is clearly a highly capable and intelligent man whose brain is basically um, failing from uh, long-standing alcohol intake. Um, so this is a study from um, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. And as we'd expect, exceeding the uh, guidelines for single occasion drinking, is typical of the younger uh, population, 18 to 24, 25 to 39. So over 40%, over 35%. Getting down to the 70 plus years, it relatively few. So they're no longer uh, doing the binging pattern, but they're still exceeding the lifetime risk, which as we know now from the revised NH and MRC guidelines is two standard drinks, maximum of 10 per week or four on any single drinking occasion. Uh, so overall, the earlier guidelines, were, which were a bit more generous, we still saw over a quarter of the population uh, exceeding uh, the single occasion risk drinking behaviour. Um, so what about the interaction between alcohol and dementia, the burden of dementia? And this is an absolutely massive study published uh, in The Lancet in 2018, Schwarzinger and all looking at 31 million uh, hospital discharges over a five year period. Um, so there were many patients diagnosed with dementia and they also uh, looked closely at the early onset dementia. And this is the onset of dementia in this lower graph before the age of 65. And in red, we can see the men on the left and the women on the right in this funnel plot. And we can see that alcohol uh, related brain damage and alcohol use disorders, related alcohol use disorders, account for up to 60% of the premature cases of dementia onset before the age of 65. Now, when you look at the entire age spectrum, um, the, the effects of alcohol are not so pronounced, but it nevertheless means that uh, alcohol ingestion uh, is more than, gives a more than threefold increased risk of, it's the strongest modifiable risk factor for dementia onset the hazard ratio of more than three for women and for men. 
So this is the leading reversible cause of dementia, particularly in the early onset. Um, we, we said in, in the um, pregnant woman that alcohol is both neurotoxic and teratogenic. So here is a manifestation of the neurotoxicity over time. Um, this brings me to another patient in, in older age who was referred from emergency. She presented in acute distress. She had a lifelong history of anxiety. She'd been widowed, living independently, still driving. Striking to me, she still smoked 15 cigarettes daily and drank a litre of wine. She was fascinated by genealogy and she sat at the computer through most of the night. So she'd got a inverted diagonal rhythm effectively. And she had a glass of wine with her while she was uh, doing her genealogy. She'd been prescribed uh, 90 milligrams of oxazepam daily for more than 40 years. Unfortunately for her, her old GP retired and the new GP decided this was not appropriate and referred her to mental health. This led to a two week admission. The oxazepam was ceased and she was started instead on metazapine. Um, she presented about six weeks later to emergency in acute distress. Uh, she was still experiencing severe withdrawal slash anxiety. And so when I spoke to uh, Magella, my colleague, um, we agreed to see her in clinic. And really, I think there was no option but to restart her oxazepam and meanwhile work on the things that we could have more uh, benefit in helping her quit. And uh, she has responded very well to that intervention, uh, reducing her tobacco intake, moderating her alcohol. And I found another GP who was willing to prescribe for her. And effectively, she's gone back to being a functioning older uh, Australian, which without this medication, she could not conceivably manage. So this is the key here. We cannot just stop uh, benzodiazepines when patients have been on them for this length of time. If we're going to taper them, which would be the preferred option, we have to do it very, very gradually, and we have to monitor patients carefully. Otherwise, uh, crisis will follow. She couldn't tolerate the metazapine. She couldn't see properly to drive safely, and um, it really didn't have any desirable effect on her anxiety. She was already on another antidepressant. So unfortunately, this plan was really not going to work. Um, so this is more data from the AIHW, and it shows us that uh, of the groups uh, using illicit drugs, most of uh, the, the population is actually lowering or fairly stable, apart from this group, the 50 to 59s, where the use of illicit drugs compared with 2001 and 2013, so they are a bit old, these figures, has been going up. The reason for this is the boomers. So they're the kind of entitled group who grew up in the 60s and 70s and drug use was you know, part of, the, part of the picture. And now they're entering retirement. Many of them are returning to drug use. So in the age uh, over 60s from the National Drug Strategy Household Survey, we've got 7.7% daily smokers, 13% with risky alcohol, almost 3% using cannabis, 2.5% uh, using opioids inappropriately and any illicit drug 7%. So this is a significant demographic where more issues may uh, be expected to arise. So pain management is a growing issue. It's a challenge to society, increases with age. We now have a growing consensus on the harms of long-term opioids outweighing the short-term benefits. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia, tolerance, the risk of overdose, progression to opioid use disorder. So we need to consider alternatives. Uh, paracetamol, however, probably not great anymore, though we used to think it helped. NSAIDs, likewise, uh, and risks for the systemic use of NSAIDs. The tricyclists do loxetine. There's some benefit there, though not always um, as effective as we'd like. And we're growing to recognise the harms, the risks of gabapentinoids, particularly pregabalin, with their limited role. So what should we be looking at in terms of pain management for old adults? And I should emphasise I'm not a pain specialist. But I think we have to agree pain medications may not be the whole answer. Uh, treat any underlying depression. Caution about the medical industry about treating low back pain with operations and implants and things. You know, maybe these aren't all as cracked up as they are to be. Once you've had a back operation, though, if you still have pain, then it's very hard to argue that the pain isn't real. So we need to focus really on lifestyle changes, quitting smoking, more physical activity, 
we need to be mindful of the patient's history. Is there a past history of substance use disorder? Are there red flags? And if we do trial opioids, there are good reasons to choose either topical buprenorphine, tramadol or tapentadol, the so-called alternative opioids, rather than down the well-trodden path to oxycodone, endone, which used to be the sort of default. Anyone prescribed opioids should be offered take home naloxone, of course, uh, and Nixoid is a very handy way, uh, which no longer requires needles because uh, it's administered intranasally. Uh, end of life care. Um, so this was from a study we did a few years ago and one patient uh, came to mind. He was a patient at Metaluca and he was found to have anal cancer on high dose long-term methadone and very stable, hadn't used drugs for 20 years. There was six month in delay from the early diagnosis, missed appointments for colonoscopy. It was a catastrophe and I, I'm distressed that it took so long for him to actually get into treatment. Meanwhile, he was getting growing pain and we steadily increased his methadone with a normal ECG to reassure us about QT. We suggested switching to fisetone, so he was outside the program, but he couldn't possibly manage 24 tablets with his clonazepam anticonvulsant for pre-existing epilepsy, not an ideal choice, but existing, and gabapentin. Okay, so not great, I agree. Um, we got palliative care review from a new registrar and uh, breakthrough pain was recommended to be managed with five milligrams of morphine. And I don't know what you guys think, but that's probably not enough to achieve anything. So what might have been a better approach? And I'm thankful to uh, Jean-Marie in Toowoomba, who we discussed a patient of hers on high dose methadone needing end of life care. And the advice from a professor in Sydney who looked after patients regularly in the palliative setting who were on uh, methadone program, leave the dose unchanged, add subcut hydromorphone. As you know, that's orally at least five times as potent as morphine milligram per milligram. The dose might be to start with four to eight milligrams four hourly. Consider lignocaine or ket ketamine infusions. Uh, Anti-inflammatories might be helpful and steroids might be helpful. So this is the kind of menu that we might consider for um, the patient with uh, end of life care with a palliative um, diagnosis who's on the high dose methadone, which really is going to mean any other opioids are going to struggle to benefit them. Now, final lap of the talk is overdose sudden death. Um, let us be very mindful of this number, 81,230 deaths in the US from overdose up until May 2020. That is an 18.5% increase on the previous year. And it seems that COVID is in significant part to blame. And the, the other major factor is the increased supply of synthetic opioids, the family of fentanyls, where there was a 38% increase in fentanyl family related deaths. Um, anyone who hasn't read the contribution of Angus and Deaton should do so. They talk of the background of deaths of despair, overdose, suicide, liver disease, leading to uh, an actual loss of life expectancy in particularly Caucasian uh, citizens um, in the States over the last five years or so. So what are the approaches? We need to make treatment with buprenorphine in particular more available and increase naloxone availability likewise. And happily so far, Australia hasn't really followed these trends. Although we do see nearly a thousand opioid deaths from overdose. Uh, this is the 2018 data from most recently available, the Pennington Overdose Report 2020. As well as that, we've got 700 or so benzo deaths, 450 stimulant deaths, almost 400 antidepressants. Now, interestingly, the cannabinoids, this is not the good old grass grown out there in the garden. This is the synthetic cannabinoids, which are getting a growing bad reputation because they are pure agonists and far more toxic than uh, THC and CBD, particularly when they're in reasonable alignment in the product, which you can't really buy anymore on the street. Antipsychotics, some overdoses, anticonvulsants, some overdoses. And I presume that includes pregabalin, which is growing in importance, particularly when combined with uh, opioids. I saw a patient earlier this week who was recently out of the Hader Clinic, which is in Gympie. Um, he did three months there for his opioid use disorder. Um, they put him on uh, pregabalin, for his low back pain. You can discuss the appropriateness of that. He stayed on it when he got home. He thought he'd try heroin and see how he went. His mother found him on the floor with no pulse. Uh, so that combination was enough to cause an overdose. Uh, 
So happily, he came to see us soon afterwards to restart his opioid treatment program. Um, mortality among clients of a statewide opioid pharmacotherapy program over 20 years. I really take my hat off to uh, these um, academics who can study uh, outcomes of patients over 20 years. So they amassed almost half a million patient years and they found clear differences between patients on and off opioid treatment therapy. So as we've seen already, off treatment in the first week, uh, very dramatic increases in uh, rate of death. Um, and the standard mortality on treatment was about 4.5 times the healthy population, but off treatment, it was eight times. And they calculate that uh, opioid treatment saved over a thousand lives. And it's very interesting, isn't it, that methadone and buprenorphine have similar results. We know buprenorphine is a better blocker. The problem, though, is that people are ease, more easily able to drop off the program uh, compared with methadone. Um, this is the ATOS outcome study. This is 11 year findings, so pretty impressive. This was a study which recruited uh, drug users in Sydney using heroin. Uh, most of them were entering treatment. Um, and what they showed was 11 years. They managed a 70 cent follow up, which is pretty impressive. Uh, about a half of patients were still in treatment, 10% had died, and a quarter were still using heroin. Those with a major depressive disorder predicted a worse outcome. Disappointingly, perhaps physical health was little changed. Mental health on treatment showed some improvement. Uh, so this really highlights to us that this is um, a major problem for health and the long-term well-being of individuals. Uh, nearly half remained on benefits. Less than one in five were working. About a quarter were living on the proceeds of crime. And as we saw, that 40% figure again uh, had been imprisoned over that 11 years. So just a plug for take home naloxone. We've got Pronoxad. That's the two milligram in two mil syringe for IM use. We've now got Nixoid from Monday. Thank you, Monday. Trying to redeem themselves perhaps available for intranasal administration. 1.8 milligrams in 0.1 mil, so a much more concentrated preparation. They're both available over the counter and on prescription. And I think uh, in Tasmania, they're now supplied through NSP as in other states. So Queensland uh, through Quinn, you can get uh, the Nixoid um, and we'd like to be able to do that through the, the Queensland Health NSPs. We haven't quite got there yet. The half-life in rock zone is fairly brief. Um, but it seems to last a bit longer when you take it intranasally from the pharmacokinetic studies, which is interesting. Um, so you have to be careful with long acting products with uh, methadone or with uh, someone who's been on a fentanyl patch, for example, which uh, gets saturated in the fatty tissues. And in addition, fentanyl for other reasons may um, be more uh, difficult to reverse with naloxone. So for the final few moments, I just thought I'd um, go through a, a, an editorial from Eric Strain, who came to uh, Sydney a few years ago. I met him at an APSAD. Um, so drug and alcohol dependence, he's been the chief editor for 15 years. And he talks about meaning and purpose in the context of opioid overdose, de overdose deaths. So let's remember he's practicing in the US where this massive um, wave of deaths has been happening now for um, 10 years or more. So he talks about meaning and purpose, five interrelated categories, health, happiness and life satisfaction, relationships, character and virtue. He talks about life domains, family, work, education, religion. He recognizes that for us fortunate enough to work in, in clinical medicine or health provision, uh, where our mission is the alleviation of suffering and nurturing patients on, on a path of growth, ascendance. And I, I know this is a little bit hippie. Flourishing is the word. Uh, nevertheless, we kind of have the, the good luck to have a sense of purpose, which drives many of us, both researchers and clinicians, to uh, overcome the barriers in trying to assist our patients. Um, we should not just focus, though, on the death from overdose and not overdosing is a rather limited endpoint. Um, we still see high dropouts from treatment. We don't really use contingency management to the max, and we shouldn't just view care as medication alone. We need to be mindful about helping our patients find their meaning and purpose. We're lucky to have, lucky to have our meaning and purpose, 
uh, we need to try and help our patients to find theirs. And I realize that's in, in many situations a tall order and we're, we're struggling with workloads and things. I think it's good to have that big picture in view nevertheless. So a few conclusions um, from today's talk. Thank you very much for your attention. So we've seen uh, very well highlighted by the GBD studies that substance use and harms vary across the age band. We're dealing with a heavily stigmatized sector of the community, particularly those using illicit drug use, though they're really causing only about 10% of the harms compared with alcohol and tobacco. So that's one of the paradoxes, is it not? Harm minimization provides a framework for policy and practice, though at the moment uh, treatment and, and harm reduction gets uh, really second um, swipe compared with the uh, harm um, supply reduction, which is where the law and order comes in. We do have a set effective treatments, and I think we could generally agree that imprisonment is not a good treatment. Society has inconsistent approaches to this subject. I don't think they realize that the average duration of sentence is less than four months. So the kind of idea that one locks people away and throws away the key is, is far from the truth. We need to ensure we're engaging our patients as well as possible with a, a non-judgmental approach to try and keep them in treatment and help them find their purpose and meaning. Uh, I, I would put to you that this is an interesting, challenging and rewarding area to work. And perhaps I'm preaching to the converted. Anyone looking to extend their studies in, in this field would be uh, very well advised to try and do so. And thank you very much for joining us today. We've got a few minutes for questions. I'll hand over to Jim. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, really interesting and informative presentation. I found I, I'm a big fan of the history of what we do, and so I found that fascinating, as well as the current perspectives as well. We've got many questions and a uh, sorry, many comments and a few questions. Um, so one comment somebody said in South Australia they have a voucher system for naloxone, um, where the client attends a clinic and gets a voucher which they can then cash for free at a chemist. Um, and we've got a question which which also relates to naloxone. So I shall ask that one to you, Jeremy. If someone is on Targin and Endone for chronic pain, including neuropathic pain from GBS, and they're also on Lyrica, should I be considering naloxone? And when would you consider prescribing naloxone for people on opioids? Thanks for the question. Um, I think the ceiling for kind of safe levels of, of opioid prescribing has steadily been coming down. So 15 years ago, it was maybe 200 milligrams, then it dropped to 100 milligrams. And in some uh, authorities view, it should be down to 50 milligrams. So effectively, that means anyone being prescribed significant doses of opioids should also be offered um, Nixoid. I think that's definitely the approach of choice. It doesn't require needles. It's simple to administer into the nostril. And if possible, we would offer training to um, the individual patient and or their family members. Um, I noticed that the, this patient being discussed is on Targin. Let's um, not forget that although Targin contains two parts uh, oxycodone and one part naloxone, because it's taken by mouth and it's a slow release product, um, its primary role is to um, try and reverse the effects on uh, the large bowel of constipation from opioids. So the naloxone is effectively minimally absorbed. And that's why we have to give it either by injection, which might be IM or subcut or IV, or intranasally, because either the sublingual route, as in the case of suboxone, or the oral route, as in the case of targin, is not really delivering significant amounts of naloxone into the system in, in almost all cases. So although uh, tar Targin contains naloxone, that is not um, going to stop someone overdosing on a, an adequate or a, a big enough dose of Targin. I hope that uh, I've made myself clear enough there. Yeah, I think so. I think the only thing I might add, just for people that aren't aware, is actually naloxone has a very short half-life as well. So any any protection that it might have offered wouldn't be around for long anyway, um, with only a 30 or 40 minute half-life. Yes, I, I did have on the slide 30, 60 minutes. It, it varies a bit. Yeah. Really, when you administer it in a non-hospital setting, it's really buying time for your ambulance to arrive and your patient, assuming they're willing, having woken up, to go to receive more definitive care. 
And in someone, for example, who may have overdosed on the control release preparations, um, and I remember a case from a couple of years ago who spent 36 hours in ICU on a naloxone infusion. She had taken massive doses of Targin and she was opioid naive. We were never quite clear where the doses came from, uh, but several hundred milligrams. And she actually needed that infusion for 48, 36 to 48 wow. hours. And I think she had a total of 20 milligrams of naloxone wow. during that time. Remember the normal dose to reverse an overdose is 0.4 milligrams or 400 micrograms. It's, yeah, that's a fair dose. Hopefully she did okay at the end of that. Hopefully she was... Yes, um, but the hospital, which was Prince Charles, actually ordered extra stock from Royal. They didn't run out, but they were worried they might. So yeah, sure. you know, it, it basically almost exhausted the hospital stock. So it's quite wow. an interesting uh, reflection. Thank you for that, Jeremy. A simple one. Somebody's asked, uh, on your case study of the 72-year-old, why did you use oxazepam rather than diazepam? Yeah, that's, that's a very reasonable question. Um, I think, you know, her liver was working reasonably well, so it wasn't because we thought she had liver failure. I think what we reasoned was she had been sufficiently distressed and um, disturbed by the change to metazapine, which hadn't been helpful or effective, that I thought the least uh, difficult option was to return to the med she'd been on for 40 years. And, you know, I agree down the track, it may be uh, a reasonable thing to switch her to diazepam. You could argue, though, that um, in someone of that age, perhaps um, the half-life of diazepam, which can be anything up to 200, year, 200 hours, not 200 years, <laughs> means that it's perhaps not entirely desirable. So I think you could argue it both ways. I, I wasn't really pressing her to withdraw. She'd had such a terrible time that we wanted just to consolidate. So we went back to what she'd been using and she was confident in that knowledge. I remember phoning her up and saying, look, I would send her a script. We'd see her a few days later. She could get back on what she was used to. And the palpable relief, you can imagine that finally she'd sort of found someone who was willing to listen. Yeah. And as somebody's written in, just as you were talking, that obviously that uh, long half-life of diazepam is going to significantly increase the falls risk, which obviously can create uh, more serious complications for the person. On, on that same case study, uh, somebody's asked, Jeremy, uh, when you put the lady back on the benzodiazepine, back on the oxazepam, was it back at the 90 milligram dose or was it at a lower dose? Uh, I hope everyone's sitting down. It was back on the 90 milligrams, yes. Okay, there you go. I, I will Thank say you. no more other than the fact that I trust your judgment entirely. Well, um, um, you're, you're right about the risk of falls. I think, you know, that's one of the reasons we try to get seniors uh, on as low dose or as little dose as possible and why it's really not recommended as a hypnotic because that combination of being sleepy, getting up in the night with a benzo on board really does increase your risk factor for uh, falls and fractured nofs and we know where that takes you so it increases your risk several fold so uh, absolutely right and in this case you know she was also drinking a litre of wine a day so uh, I agree it's pretty hot business so not what we the doctor would recommend necessarily. And someone else has just added just while we stay on that case could, have you got any comment on chronic benzo use and cognitive impairment just in general not specific yeah to that's, that's an excellent question and i think although the jury was in for a while then it went out again so uh, there was a study from the states looking at large pool data showing dramatic adverse uh, consequences on cognition and then there was a huge study from france which really refuted that. And I think the French study had the numbers just as they did for the alcohol dementia study. Um, so I, I used to tell patients that one of the worries with um, benzo use was um, bringing on premature or, or bringing forward dementia. Now I'm not so sure. So I think during the uh, time you're on benzos, you do have some impairment of cognition. So anyone who's tried to counsel someone on a high dose of uh, a benzodiazepine knows their memory is, is affected and they're not necessarily processing very well. So in those circumstances, that's an excellent driver to try and bring the dose down. Um, so that sort of answered your question. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, somebody else has asked about uh, QOT or uh, opioid uh, treatment in prisons within Queensland. Um, could you say how whether it is rolled out and if it isn't rolled out through all 
prisons in Queensland. Somebody said that they suggested it was in other states. Why are Queensland behind, potentially? Oh, that's a little... <laughs> Topic. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think it's a bit like the patient who's neither quite pregnant nor not pregnant. So it is gradually rolling out. Um, I think the kind of approach, it's really the women's uh, prison where they were able to lead the way because of that interaction with pregnancy and the undesirability of opioid withdrawal during pregnancy. So the women's has had um, opioid treatment long, long standing. Sure. Um, the north of the state uh, certainly has opioid treatment. We had um, Dr. Nick down from Townsville last week, uh, just getting some sort of experience with us. And he's using the long acting injections in the jail in Townsville. In southeast corner of Queensland, which is where the majority of jails are, it's a slightly more mixed picture. And broadly, if you go into custody on a high dose of methadone, um, so above 80 milligrams probably, that will almost certainly be continued. Um, we, we shouldn't overlook the fact that there is widespread injecting of Suboxone, which is contraband and, and not meant to be there. Um, but what I'd like to see in the prison setting is that those with opioid use disorder who need uh, treatment, maintenance treatment in prison should have access particularly to the long acting because it's a monthly dose. It doesn't matter if you miss a day uh, earlier or later for that month you're not going to run into problems and it's much easier than having people queue up and be supervised to have daily dosing with standover and diversion. Um, somebody's added on to that and asked, is there any evidence on the LAI use in prison? So the LI long acting injectable buprenorphine in prisons. Well, whether you call it evidence or not, I'm, I'm not certain. I think uh, in the, in the Queensland system, there's probably 50 or 100 people on LAI um, in total around the state. In New South Wales, I know they've gone really uh, gangbusters and there's seven or 800. And I think there's actually a seminar coming up um, discussing the experience of the long acting in the uh, New South Wales custodial system. Uh, that's in a week or two with Professor Adrian Dunlop. So I should uh, commend that to you and I'm sure um, Insight can send out the details. Definitely, we can do that. Yep, definitely. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, we've got a couple more. I'm, I'm watching the time carefully because I know you've got to go off to clinic. Uh, somebody's put, I'm working with young people that smoke buprenorphine. Have you come across that before? And is there any studies on that that you're aware of? Um, I've just heard anecdotes about it. Um, you know, most, most things seem to be smokable, don't they? Uh, including yep. tea bags that have been used... Uh, with a nicotine patch wrapped around them, which is why yeah. the patches were withdrawn from the, the prison system. So, uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The, the people are very imaginative, uh, snorting and smoking are certainly roots of uh, administration. So, I don't have any literature to uh, critique. No, that's fair enough. Um, I think. Uh, what was the next one I had? Apologies, I've got. Uh, what are your thoughts on disulfiram and its safety and efficacy for selected patients? Disulfiram, so that's the... Sorry, uh, the way I say it is not correct. That's right, the chemical name for antabuse. Yes, that term I know well. <laughs> <laughs> I prescribed it um, just last week for um, one of the clinicians who was referred, um, and they rang yesterday to say, that the pharmacy had told them that there was no stock. So that gives me an opportunity to say that while Antibuse, which is the trade name for disulfiram, is out of stock and has been very hard to get hold of in recent months, the way around that is by going to a compounding pharmacy. So a compounding pharmacy, they mix up with pestles and mortars and, and capsules, they mix up their own drugs. And so if you take a script, and I gave this person a script both for the antabuse and the disulfiram from a compounding pharmacy, if you take it to a compounding pharmacy, and there are a few around Brisbane, they're not every pharmacy by any means, there are a few, however, there's one in Spring Hill, for example. Um, if you take the script there, they will make up your prescription for you. And they do it typically in 100 milligram capsules. And so the dose would be 200 milligrams daily, two capsules. And you typically get 100 on a script. And the price is, is probably relatively competitive with, with um, antabuse. Unfortunately, neither of these are on the PBS. They're not subsidized. 
the feeling is that the evidence for efficacy is not good enough. And the problem is that people forget to take it. So if uh, there's a system that ensures people do take it regularly, then it works very well. It's rather old fashioned though. It's sort of punishing you for doing the wrong thing, isn't it? So we certainly don't use it as first line. For patients who are willing, um, I think it's certainly available as an option, assuming their liver works reasonably well. Thank you, Jeremy. And just building on a, a comment that you said there about punishing uh, clients, I understand what you mean by that. But somebody has written in and said uh, that the obviously the national drug strategy is from a harm reduction approach. And they've said that with clients who are dependents, would abstinence not be a better view to approach? And why do we take harm reduction as the stance that we take? Well, um, anyone old enough to remember Nancy Reagan and uh, her campaign to keep uh, young people um, intact. So she promoted the idea of wearing a silver ring. And I think on the ring was written, just say no. That's right. I remember that. that I mean, you know, it's complete BS, I'm afraid. And if just saying no and wagging your finger at people worked, then we'd do it. The problem is it doesn't work. Whereas we know harm reduction is very effective in reducing the harms. And my wife likes to say that what you're doing is really keeping people alive until they reach uh, a stage in their existence in their life, hopefully a rich and fulfilling life, where they no longer need substances to compensate for other stuff that's going on. Now, yeah, that's, you know, that's essentially what I've always felt. It's a partial view that, and we know there are other factors involved. However, we also know that part of recovery is regaining purpose and meaning, as I was discussing in those final slides. And if there are other things going on with your family, with kids, with your home environment, with work, then the attractions of being out of it on substances are, are going to be greatly reduced, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, going back to one of the studies that you presented that was regarding to adverse childhood events and the methylation of genes oh, yeah. um, and it was higher it, the, the expression was higher in females than it was in males did that study then go on to look at whether that correlated with higher levels of distress in later life with things such as dependence issues and so on well i mean i think we're all kind of familiar with that idea that um the the female who's been affected by adverse childhood experience tends to develop those internalizing responses, which may manifest as self-harm and uh, anxiety. Whereas the male who's had similar experiences tends to express those in an antisocial way, uh, causing harm and violence towards others. So um, I think, you know, the antisocial way may be more prone to use substances, um, the uh, internalizing person, the, the, the female, and these are sweeping generalizations, I realize. Yeah, is, yeah no, is, I appreciate is, that. Is more likely perhaps to um, engage in those kind of self harming behaviors somehow. So I, I don't know that that explains fully the difference in um, levels of dependence, because typically men are twice as commonly represented, but perhaps women yeah. are less help seeking. And um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Yes, perhaps women find it harder to access treatment. So maybe, uh, and, and yes, men are perhaps more impulsive as well. So there is yeah. a range of factors that predict who lands up as uh, having a substance use disorder. And, and those are some of them. Yeah, I agree. And someone's actually written in, and I know you're going to, I know your answer to this. So I was reading it as much as a statement as a question. Do you think addressing trauma through counselling and building a value for one's own self and improving meaning and purpose in life is going to be more successful in tackling other issues? And I think you've just kind of said that overall there, that that's something you certainly believe in. Well, I, I, I certainly think so. And, you know, our, our service in Metro North and other services too, is now trying to embrace a, a, a trauma-informed care approach. So Definitely. A, that's Definitely. recognizing, and B, it's trying to address. Um, I've got quite a nice example that I used in a presentation recently. So we had a lady who developed alcohol use disorder because that was the only thing she could find that um, settled her restless legs. And she hadn't slept for years and found alcohol. And she went on to drink so much, she developed cirrhosis. And when she saw the clinic at the Royal, um, they said, well, haven't you tried um, a dopamine agonist like Pramipexol? And she hadn't at that stage. So that was what they started. And miraculously, 
her restless legs disappeared. So miraculously, she stopped drinking. So that's a nice example of a physical cause of the drinking, which once addressed, the drinking goes away. Now, again, this is an oversimplification, yeah. but it's a nice illustration of what we might hope to happen if we can address the trauma and kind of Definitely. lay those sores to rest. Definitely. Thank you, Jeremy. I've got one last one that I'm going to put to you, and it, I'm interested to hear your response. Um, so contingency management always comes out as having a high efficacy for treatment with our clients. Um, you know, we've had Carl Hart showing studies on methamphetamine and the ones you showed on smoking. What do you think needs to change in Australia for that to be acceptable um, as a treatment modality here? And because you presented about substance use through the ages, what would you like to see in the future regarding treatment for our clients? How would you like to see it develop? Well, um, I think it's a sort of definitely an under um, implemented resource that we would be wise to try and um, get get on board with. Um, I know that some of the contingency management is actually getting your name in a raffle to sort of gamble prizes. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that's sending a completely healthy message out there. <laughs> I, um, hear you. I, think, I think we do need, as our colleague from South Australia said, we perhaps need a voucher system of some sort which gives people uh, immediate uh, feedback. And that's where the smokalizer for smoking yeah, definitely. is so handy because you can actually tell the patient, yes, your, your expired carbon monoxide is in the normal range. You are no longer smoking. That's fantastic. Here's your voucher for. Um, we're doing a study at the moment on the 2D6 and we're uh, rewarding those who agree to participate with a mouse swab with a $30 Coles voucher which can't be spent on alcohol or tobacco, yeah. it says on the, um, on the card. So I think something of that sort is, is really going to be helpful. What we need to recognize though, is that some people out there might think this is uh, giving drug users special treatment and why the hell can't they just pull themselves together? So it's about community education and trying to build that level of acceptance.